it's Allison and this is my story of overcoming my journey through domestic violence. Um, when I was 21 years old, I met a guy in a bar and I thought that I had fallen head over heels for him. We had a lot of fun together. He was a lot of fun. Um, our whole life was just each other and partying and, and having a, a good time because that's what life was about when you're 21. At least that's what I thought for a little while. Um, but everything appeared to be really, really great on the outside and about three months into our relationship, um, he kicked me in the face. Uh, the abuse started then because I got a text message from someone that he didn't know and so that went from him checking in on me and the concerned boyfriend, you know, being loving to be a part of my life and things like that to the controlling boyfriend who wanted to, to check on everything um, because he thought that I was cheating or he thought that I was lying and so it just progressively got worse. Um, things were, were still fun at times. They were either really good or they were really bad. Um, our, our life was was a lot of drinking and partying and so to everyone else you know we were having fun we were always the life of the party we always had people around we were always involved in the fun things and um, it just it just changed and progressively got worse from there the beatings went from the shoving and, and pushing calling me names slapping me around a little bit to progressively worse um, I started getting punched, I started getting um, bruises that I couldn't hide, cracked ribs, thrown into things. The beatings wouldn't just last seconds, they would last days. Um, the fights got a lot worse and um, after the fighting would stop, things progressed in, and got a lot worse. So beating me turned into rape. So I would tell him no and I, I didn't want to do things and that would start the fight. I would get beat until I couldn't stand and then raped because I couldn't fight him off. I tried to hide it and go about life as normal. I still went to work every day. I lied to my family, lied to my friends. And, oh, I got this bumper bruise from softball practice or I ran into a doorknob and can only run into so many doorknobs before people start asking more and more questions so I started distancing myself from people I stopped going to family functions I stopped going to holidays um, I stopped having friends basically all of my friends were his friends so if we weren't at a party then I was with him constantly, all the time. As the fights got worse and as the beatings got worse, so did the consequences. Um, so raping me and hitting me weren't the only things that he did. He decided to um, take it a step further and show me a loaded gun that he kept in his bedroom. They, uh, it went from showing me the placement of the gun to reminding me that the gun was there to pulling the gun on me if he didn't get his way. And um, one in particular time, he grabbed me by the hair, he pulled me over to his side of the bed, put the gun in my mouth, and told me to say my prayers. And I started praying. I started just babbling and pleading for my life begging him not to do it. Um, he pulled the hammer back on the gun and pulled the trigger and I just melted in fear. Um, my, I collapsed. I thought the gun was going to go off and when it didn't he laughed at me. It was such a malicious laugh and he told me, you see how scared you are now? Just imagine what else I can do if you don't listen to me. So there were, there were always threats, there was a constant fear 
that I should just obey and do whatever he tells me to do. But he had convinced me that the reason why I was getting beat all the time was because I, I did it, I made him. He had literally taken this outgoing, outspoken, just lively, carefree person and turned me into a reclusive, just sad person. Like I just looked like someone had just snuffed out my light. And so he had convinced me that it was my fault that I caused the beatings and I caused the fights and I caused things to happen. So um, I was told that I was going to start going to, to therapy and that I was going to have to talk to someone, but if I mentioned the abuse, that he would know. Um, so I, I went to therapy for a while um, and a long while before the therapist started asking deeper questions, started you know prodding into my life a little bit more. And I, I finally, briefly told him, but I finally had to break down and tell him, you know, that, that there was some physical abuse going on and that um, I was just sad and, and scared and I really didn't want to talk about it and I didn't know what to say or, or what to do. And um, the therapist gave me some advice, but I, I didn't listen. Um, I didn't want to hear the things that he was saying to me. I didn't want to be a victim. I didn't want to have something wrong with me. I didn't want to believe that the man that I was in love with was capable of not being able to stop doing what he was doing to me. I wanted to see the best in him. I thought the more I loved him, the more he would love me back. Or if I just could love him a little bit harder that he may not hit me less. So I just kept trying. I kept loving him. I kept hiding and, and reclusing away from people. Um, but then it became apparent it started to affect my job. It started to, it had already affected my life, but I just hadn't seen it until I started talking about it. So I, I reached out to just a few close people. Um, I tried to get help, but anytime I tried to leave or anytime I, I did leave, it got worse for me. He was such a smooth talker. He always convinced me to come back. You know, he was sorry or he loved me. And, and I believed him, I wanted to believe him. And so I would inevitably go back uh, over and over. And so many times that I, I lost count. <laughs> I didn't know if we were broken up or if we were together, but I just knew that I loved him and I wanted to make it work. Um, it got to the point where I was facing termination from my job and my family were fully involved at this point. Uh, they just couldn't see me go through the, the beatings anymore. They could not handle me lying to their faces about the things that I was going through. And it was obvious to people that I was getting you know, beat up and, and that I was broken and just not the person that, that they knew me to be. And I just couldn't admit it to myself. So I decided to go try out a women's self-defense class. I thought that if he was going to beat me, I might just need a little bit of protection under my belt, <laughs> like learn some judo moves. I really didn't know what I was look, you know, getting into or looking forward to, but I thought that I'd try it out. So I went to the police department here in town and they were offering a self-defense class for women. Uh, so I attended the class. Um, about halfway through the class, I started having to go one-on-one -on -one with people and we would, we would not fight, but we would face off against each other and we would practice the, the different techniques that they were teaching you. And when someone would lunge at me a certain way or if someone got too close to me, I'd get really nervous. And I ended up dropping the class before it was over with because it, it was all too real to me. It was real in a sense that I'd never really thought about being a victim before until this self-defense class. And then the word victim became really really real and really evident and, and that that was me, that I was a victim, a victim of domestic violence, a victim of abuse. Um, I just, I knew that I had to change. I just didn't know 
how to change. I didn't know what I needed to do to get out of this situation. It was just too much, it was just all of the emotions. I was happy, then I was sad, then I was getting beat up, and then I was happy again. I mean, just all of the emotions were running through all the time. I just thought I was losing my mind. I literally thought that I was going crazy. And what it was, was I was just realizing that the life that I was living was it was a nightmare, that it was real. You know, he was a monster and he had broken me and he had turned me into somebody different. And I didn't want to be that person anymore. I didn't recognize the person that I looked at in the mirror. I wanted so badly to see my family again and to have friends and to be able to talk to someone. I felt like I was standing in a crowd full of people screaming at the top of my lungs, help me, he, he hits me, and no one could hear me. And it was a really lonely place, a really scary place, but the more I tried to leave, the worse it got. He started threatening my family. He would send me photos of my family out and about in public places, letting me know that he could get to them. And if he could get to them, then he could get to me. So I should just do myself a favor and come back and stop leaving him and stop calling the cops. And I just didn't realize that he had me wrapped around this false facade that I called love. Um, I just really thought the more I loved him, the more I could save him. And it was turning out that the more I loved him, the more I was killing myself. So we tried to change things up in our relationship a little bit and so we started spending more time on the lake or going to different events like concerts and parties and we, we ended up out um, at a local lake here in town where we would spend our summers and um, we had so much fun. We would party during the day, drive home or drive into town and go to work during the day, party at night. I mean, it was just a lot of fun. Um, we were starting to forget about the bad things because the, if you party nonstop and if you surround yourself with people nonstop, you know, there's less and less opportunity and times that the abuse can happen or a fight can break out. So we're out on this lake and um, I, I'm not a particularly strong swimmer. So I mostly floated and, and just had fun, but he tried to um, throw me overboard. He took me to different places around the lake and showed me on a, a monitor, a little screen that he had in his boat, he would show me the different depths of the lake and he would tell me, you know, this is where I'll hide your arms, this is where I'll hide your legs, and that's where I'll cut your head off and leave it. Um, they'll find your heart out there, they'll, they'll just never be able to piece you together, the fish will eat you before anybody finds you. And then he proceeded to just reassure me that he, I was his and that I could not leave. Uh, no matter how hard I tried, no matter what types of classes I went to or defense moves I learned or people I told that he would take them out too and that I had nowhere else to run. So at that point, I knew that I had to really, really leave and not come back. Um, he had nearly killed me, thrown me over the side of the boat. He had drive at high speeds and knock me from side to side of this boat. Um, I had cracked ribs. I had numerous bruises, lacerations, I was bleeding from my ears, just trauma to my body. And I was so beat down and so wore out. The only thing that I could do when he finally threw me overboard and I thought that I was going to die was I, I cried out to God. You know, I just made peace with God right then because I, I hadn't relied on him in such a long time, I had turned my back on God and completely forgotten about Him because I felt in that time in my life that He had forgotten about me, um, that I wasn't worthy to be saved, that I wasn't, I, the 
things that I had done had degraded me so much that, that God didn't want me as his child anymore. But I cried out to him in that moment just to forgive me and, and save me. All the times that I hadn't been saved before, I just wanted to be saved right then and not saved so I would live, but saved so that I would go to heaven because I, I just knew that that was the moment that I was going to die. And um, all I wanted in that moment was for my family to know that I was gonna be okay, that I had made everything right with God before I died. Miraculously, when he threw me overboard, I landed on a sandbank out near the lake and um, was able to swim to shore. And when I got to shore, um, I just started walking and towards the road looking for anyone that could help me. And I don't remember who it was, but I remember a lady picking me up and taking me into town only to later find out um, she was a friend of my parents. I feel like God kind of sent her my way that night because she normally wasn't out in that area. So I get to town and I call the cops and I tell them everything that had happened. We're, we're still close to the lake at the time that I had called the police. So I um, went through the whole scenario with the cops. At that time, the laws in the state had changed for domestic violence, so the cops no longer determined who was at fault. They just arrested both parties and the judge would decide. So um, Easter weekend, uh, instead of spending it at church or with my family, I spent three nights in the county jail um, for domestic battery. Both he and I did. We were both arrested and we couldn't see a judge because it was a holiday until Monday. Um, sitting in jail, somewhere I never thought that I would end up, really, really just hit me like a ton of bricks. All of the anger that I should have felt over years and years of abuse finally kicked in. I, I hated him. I hated everything about him. I hated my life. I hated those who had stood by and watched it happen. I hated myself for lying to people and for believing him. I hated him so much I called my mom. I told her where he hid the money at his house and I said, come bail me out. <laughs> like, use his money though, don't use your money. Um, she didn't. By the grace of God, my mom let me sit there all weekend long and stew in this just anger and hatred for him. And it, and it finally made me leave. Uh, we both got out of jail the following Monday and were told by the judge, you know, do not have contact with each other or you come back here. Well, three days is all it took for me to learn that that was not a place I ever wanted to go again. So I left and it didn't matter how many times he called, I didn't answer. It didn't matter how many times he drove by my house, I wasn't home. Um, but then the abuse switched. He couldn't get to me physically, so the abuse had to be emotional and, and mental and everything else it could be. He started threatening my family a lot more. He started stalking me, so I went into survival mode at that point. I got an apartment lease in a co-worker's mom's name, like something that straight out of a horror flick. I mean, you just things that you wouldn't even think of to do that I thought <laughs> were legitimately crazy, but I did them, you know. So I got an apartment where he couldn't find me. I hid from him. I changed my number three times in a matter of months. I tried to get protection from him when it would fall through with the courts. I reached out to friends of mine. I mean, just anything I could do to stay in hiding. But it, it didn't stop there. 
one day I was driving from a college class that I was taking back to work on my lunch break and he saw me in traffic and turned around and followed me. So I hadn't felt fear like that since the last time that I had seen him, but I, I saw him in the rear view mirror. He's following me, he's honking at me. He almost hits these cars just to try to get behind me in traffic. And I realized then like, like he's, he's coming after me. Like I really have to leave, like I have to hide. He can't get me. So I, I call my dad, who comes out of our work building, as I worked with in the same building as my dad at the time. He comes outside with a friend of his and they run him off. They scare him off. Uh, I, don't, I don't see him again for a while, but the abuse doesn't stop there. And when I say abuse, I mean like the, the constant stalking and the fear that I lived in. Um, I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to walk outside. If I did, I thought everyone looked like him. I, I saw him everywhere. I felt like I was being followed. Um, so my natural instinct was to run. Uh, I left and went out of the state for a couple of weeks just visiting family. And, and I really didn't want to return because it, it was so good. It was so nice to be away from him and not have any contact from him and to breathe fresh air and not look over my shoulder. Um, but the day that I came back into town, the calls started again. It was crazy how he would get my number even after I changed it. I had no idea who was getting my, giving him my number, how he was getting it. I cut off all of my friends and family, just kept them at a distance. I didn't save any of their numbers in my phone. I didn't give it out. If they wanted to see me, I did that in person. Somehow, time and time again, he would get in contact with me and he would call me and he would scare me back into hiding. Um, six months after I finally left, the only relief I got from this nightmare that was my life, it was my reality, was when I got a call one morning that he had taken his own life. And for the first time in years, I felt a weight off of my shoulders. I, I felt relieved and guilty at the same time. Like, how could I be a good person if I felt glad that somebody wasn't here anymore? So after years and years of running, I realized that he wasn't the only thing I was running from, that I was running from God, and that like a light came on, that God had saved my life so many times, over and over and over again. He saved me from the, the gun in my mouth. He saved me from being thrown overboard. He saved me from the beatings and all of the abuse. And I had never thanked him or even thought that he had been there and yet he had been there all along. So I fell on my knees before God and just gave it all back to him. I had ran for far too long and decided that if I, since I had done my whole life backwards for the first time in a long time, I was going to do everything right. Everything, just clean slate, start over, from square one, live life the right way. So I started hanging out with my friends and family again. I started going to church regularly. I finally meet this really sweet guy who's very interested in dating me and, and I just pushed him away. Um, tried to like not show any interest at all, tried to run him off, told him how crazy I was, and I just told him, you don't, you don't want a part of this, like you don't want to be in my life, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not a nice person, like you don't want to date me. And nothing I said scared this guy off. Um, so I decided to tell him, well, if, if you want to date me, then you're gonna have to go to church with me because yeah, that's what I do, that's my life. And, and he agreed. So we started going to church together and those were, that's kind of like our date night. You know, we would go to church or we would meet up on Sundays. Um, I would only hang out with him in a group setting or with my family or with friends, people that I trusted. 
and inevitably um, I started really falling for this guy. We kept going to church together. We ended up engaged. We ended up getting saved. We were married and saved before we had our, our child, welcomed a child into the world. For the first time in forever, I started living the right way and God just threw everything else into place. It's like he knew all along that he was in control of the whole situation. But I'm now married to the guy that I tried to run off all of those long months that he waited for me. Um, and I'm living my best, best life, best version of myself with the help of God. I absolutely would not be here today had I not given my life back to Him.